We now come to the fourth section in the wasteland, titled Death by Water. And as we've seen in earlier sections, Eliot used the ancient understanding of the elements to construct the organization for the wasteland overall. The structure of it is somewhat unified by those elements, and so this fourth element is dominated by that of water. And interestingly, we've seen a hint at this section already uh, with the comment at toward the end of the Burial of the Dead with the episode concerning Madame Sesostris and the reading of fortunes from the cards from the tarot pack. And remember, there are two things that Madame Sesostris reads in our fortunes as readers and as participants and citizens of this modern wasteland in which we are all trapped. Uh, and the first card that uh, she read in that reading that applies to this section is the card of the wheel, particularly the wheel of fortune or of fate. And we saw in that section that the wheel for Eliot, the circle image, was the quintessential image for uh, existence and the universe as we know it. It describes the circular nature of the blood as it diffuses throughout the body. It describes the turning of the seasons through the years, the turning of the clock around from morning to evening. Uh, it describes the turning of the orbits of the planets. That this circular image, this wheel image, is the monotonous, unending routine that we seem to all be trapped in, that our lives are simply pivoted by uh, this turning of the wheel over and over again, that we are simply different hash marks on the wheel as it turns throughout all of human history. And the second card she uh, read was actually the last in the card, the last in the deck that she had read back in The Burial of the Dead, and that is the command to fear death by water. We are told to fear this fate that she read as the ultimate destiny for all mankind. That we are to understand our death as an imminent and unwavering reality in every man's future. But ultimately she brings the imperative to fear death by water. And interestingly, as she predicts that fate and that fortune for all of us as readers uh, and as uh, members of the human race caught in the barrenness of the wasteland, in the poem itself, the fear for the coming death by water is literally given and implied that what she predicted would come in the burial of the dead has now come as the penultimate section in the wasteland. We now have encountered death by water. As we look at the short section here, we begin this section with an insight into a certain character that Eliot has used in other works of his, and that is Phlebas the Phoenician. And a helpful understanding of who the Phoenicians were uh, would be appropriate in understanding the context of this death by water and how it is applied in this section. The Phoenicians themselves were well-known tradesmen, and particularly sailors. These are people who are particularly adept at sailing the seas. They were a commercial people. Uh, they were merchants that would uh, take to the waters to trade with other countries, and uh, that was their well-known market. That was what they were predominantly famous for, the Phoenicians. So Phlebas, being a Phoenician, it's safe to assume that he would have been a skilled sailor. Yet, notice the irony, Phlebas the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, just a quick passing note, that even the central figure of this section begins the section already dead. Uh, that is a, a helpful remark on the imminence and inevitability of death that Eliot has already commented on several times so far that we are given a reminder of in this first line. We are introduced to a character uh, that Eliot will later describe as handsome and tall, possibly even successful. Yet, the first description we get of this character is that he is dead and has been dead for some time. Remember the image in the burial of the dead, that men march asleep. 
that they are simply the walking dead. But notice how he's described here. Phoebus the Phoenician, the Phoenician a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell and the profit and loss. Now this is an interesting uh, comment that Eliot is making about Phoebus the Phoenician here. Being a sailor and, and a seaman, uh, fortnight dead, and having forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell, seems to indicate that he no longer knew what he was born to know. And that's, an, that's a helpful insight to see here with Eliot introducing this character, that Phlebas the Phoenician, probably a well-known sailor, someone who would have spent his life at sea, has forgotten the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell. The very nature and fundamental element of sailing the seas, he has forgotten. He no longer knows what he was destined to know. That what he was born to do, what he had governed and lived his life by, he can no longer remember. So beyond the fact that he has been dead for some time, we can assume that he, up until that point, had forgotten the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell. He, was, he no longer knew what he was born to know. He forgot the sea. Which again, given the understanding of the Phoenicians and how intimately tied to the open waters they were as a people, for Phlebas to have forgotten the sea and the very nature of it seems to indicate he forgot home or maybe even his very identity. Which is a common characteristic for those caught in the wasteland that who they once were and what they once governed their life by, and what was once most valuable and most intimate to them, is now faded and dissolved in their very hands, that he no longer remembers his home. He no longer remembers who he is, what he was born to do. One might even say he has forgotten his purpose. He forgot the cry of goals and the deep sea swell. Notice these are sensory depictions of his life at sea, it's not, he for, it's not that he forgot simple data or facts about the sea, he forgot the feel of it. He forgot his emotional purpose, or even connection to the world around him. He forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell, as well as the profit and loss the sort of financial bearings he once had in this life at sea. Uh, so even that with, which had intrinsic, literal value, a monetary value to what he was born to do, is also robbed, is also faded from him. He has forgotten it. It has been lost to the oblivion of, uh, of broken memory. So note that the two different kinds of value that can be placed on his existence, his natural, sentimental, human purpose, what he was born to do, as well as the social, financial, intrinsic value given to what he was born to do. All of it is forgotten and lost. All of it is pulled under the sea by a current that he cannot control. Note that he is dragged under sea by a force of nature, an external force that pulls him under, a force in which he is caught and dragged underneath that he cannot control. And it's a, it's a part of nature he was born to control, a born to understand, born to navigate. The Phoenicians ought to have been able to govern and manipulate the currents, to control them, to understand them, to abide by them, and make meaning from them. Yet here the current overtakes him. The great reversal. He who once had command over the currents now is under their command. A current under sea picked his bones in whispers. Remember in the fire sermon we have the scene of the rat 
uh, scuttling across the alley, picking over dead men's bones strewn about, and the faint sound of the wind rattling the bones in the vacated realm of the Thames River in the wasteland. Now again we see nothing remains of Phlebas the Phoenician but his bones, and the picking at those bones from natural elements. In the fire sermon it was the feet of a rat, and death by water is the deepest depths of the sea, moving across a dead man's bones as it has drowned. As he rose and fell, again, the corpse of Phlebas rising and falling with the tide, uh, an image of the reduction of humans. He has been reduced and trivialized. He is simply a floating body, keeping with the tide of nature. Everything that he had once accomplished, everything that he had once made for himself, now simply floats above the sea. He rises and falls, and as he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth. There's that wheel image. That he is going through the stages of youth and age over and over and over again as he rises and falls. The image of youth to adulthood, that progression is depicted as a monotonous circular motion. The tide rises, the tide falls, the tide rises again, and he rises and falls with it. He is simply helpless and trapped by his circumstances that ultimately overwhelm him. And he passes those stages over and over again, entering the whirlpool. There's that quintessential image again. That in the final moments of Phlebas' life, uh, he is simply caught in the whirlpool, moving round and round, much like the flush of a modern toilet. Simply devolving, spiraling downward like the layers of hell we saw in the burial of the dead. And particularly the idea of entering the whirlpool, and the prospect of a whirlpool is that uh, there's a hope still in being caught in this agonizing monotony. And there's a hope that there's a still point at the center. So while Eliot contends that the wasteland is a tragedy, it is an absolute bleak and despairing, hopeless reality for mankind, Yet there are still these flashes of hope we see. It was the church of Magnus Martyr uh, in the fire sermon after the typist's passage where we see a glimpse of heaven, the inexplicable splendor, he calls it, of Ionian white and gold. This image of Zion that appears briefly and then we plummet again back into the depths of the wasteland. Here again, we have the wheel image, the monotonous turning and turning and turning of the gyre, just the the way we are caught in the machinery of existence that simply revolves around nothing. Yet, the idea of a whirlpool is perhaps that there's an eye in the storm. Perhaps there is a calm, stable center point that we are spiraling into. While Eliot allows for the possibility of that center being complete oblivion, blankness, and simple cessation of life, that we just end when we die, there is no promise of an afterlife, there is no rebirth or resurrection, as we saw in section 1. There is still yet the hint that perhaps that center is a center of calm, the center of the whirlpool being a stable, peaceful possibility. But again, he allows for no real conclusiveness here. And then he ends this section uh, describing all mankind. Remember in the fire sermon we had the, the figure of Tiresias, the all-male, all-female mythological figure who uh, is blind but can see much more clearly than most of us uh, beyond the surface of physical reality. Here he describes all of humanity as Gentile or Jew. Which if you remember, Paul writes in Galatians and in Ephesians of both Gentile and Jew being harmonized or reconciled in Christ here, it seems the narrator is seeking to encompass all of humanity, both Gentile and Jew, all peoples. He says, Oh, you who turn the wheel and look to windward. So there's our wheel image again. 
Now he's addressing those of us who are still alive. You who turn the wheel and look to windward. Those of us who are still sailing the seas, looking to the wind, looking to uh, the gust that will fill our sails and allow us to move on, move forward, to accomplish something, to reach a destination of some kind. Those of us who look to the wind, look to the prospect of our future, still turning the wheels of our lives, turning the days and months and years of our lives. He says, consider Phlebas. And the imperative to consider is the imperative to do what Phlebas could not do. Remember, Phlebas forgot the cry of goals in the deep sea swell. We are called as readers to consider Phlebas, which again, this is a moment of possible hope in the face of absolute despair. He beckons the reader to remember Phlebas, consider him who was once handsome and tall as you. Consider he who had as much potential and as many prospects as you do. Consider him who, when he was alive, looked to windward, looked to the horizon, looked to a purpose and a destination and an ultimate meaning to his life. Remember him. Remember. Consider Phlebas. Regard his story. Never forget what happened to him the way he forgot what was most essential in his life, the cry of goals, the deep sea swell, the very thing he was born to know he no longer knew, and the speaker calls out to us as the reader to remember. Remember at the end of the burial of the dead, where he calls the reader, a hypocrite, a hypocrite reader, mon semblable, mon, mon frere, my likeness, my brother, you are not different from me. And now he's reaching out to the reader again in the last moment before the final section to remember Phlebas, consider his story, do not forget what you were made to do, the, your purpose for being here. Again, here's that possible hopeful center to the wheel. Perhaps there is a center to the whirlpool, an eye in the storm, that provides meaning and hope and shelter from all the chaos and barrenness of the wasteland. And perhaps that center is reached through memory. Remember at the beginning of the wasteland where April and the showers of April mix memory and desire. That maybe our desire for a center that can hold is only accessible through memory of those who have gone before us, those who have fallen away, those who have forgotten the cry of goals, and to see their example, to see what has happened to them, and rather than fear death by water, perhaps learn from it.